All right, well, happy Sunday, Bridgepoint, and welcome to week one of a new series that we are calling Cleverly First Corinthians, a series that's gonna have us camped out in Paul's first letter to the church that is in Corinth. We're gonna be exploring the content that he passed along, the information that he passed along to the church there in Corinth, and also examining the ways uh, that it matters for us today, what it says to us, why it matters, and how it is a word that is relevant and pertinent to the church today. Who we are is a gathered people, the type of community that we are called to be and how we are to operate as people who gather with faith and trust following Jesus Christ. I want to shout out, first of all, to everybody who's downtown, folks out in Seminole or our online campus, people here in the room at Tyrone. You're looking good. Y'all ready? Yeah. All right. It's going to be a fun series we're looking forward to today. And I want to start off this series and start off today's message with this Big question. What makes people in the church distinctly different? Don't shout it out. You're looking around. You're like, I'll tell you what makes people different. What makes people in the church distinctly different? What sets us apart from other communities, from other people that gather together? What separates the church, making us distinctly different from all the rest? Now, by way of story, after I graduated college, I worked in a law firm in Atlanta for just a little bit. Had I gone to law school? No. Did I have any legal experience? Not on the positive side of the law. So I was the perfect candidate for this perfect position and the perfect job. But one day, I got a call from a guy who was calling in looking for an attorney, and he said, I need an attorney. He must have been from the rural part of Atlanta. He said, I need an attorney because I got a case against a fella, and by fella, I mean a crook. I mean a fraud. He said, I hired this guy to do some work on my house, and after I paid him the deposit, I never heard from him or saw him again. He said, the worst part about it was that he told me he was a Christian. He told me he went to church, and he said, and I go to church, so I trusted this guy. And he said, the worst part, too, was that he had one of them little Christian fishies on his business card. And I knew what he was talking about. I just wanted to hear him explain that. I said, Christian fishies? He goes, yeah, you know the Christian fish symbol that lets everyone know that you're a Christian and that you go to church. I said, but that ain't how a Christian's supposed to act. That ain't how people in the church are supposed to operate and treat each other. And he said, come to think of it, I bet that wasn't a Christian fish on his business card. I bet it was a shark. <laughs> he said, the only thing fishy about that guy was the way he lives his life. Friends, I share that because I think sometimes in the church, we can get a reputation, we can get people's opinions about who we are, how we operate, whether it's good or bad, based on initial observation, the way we interact with the world around us. As we start this series on 1 Corinthians, you should know that there was something fishy going on in the Corinthian church. And the people inside the church, the people that gathered as the church, they weren't acting how they're supposed to act. Rather than embodying a distinctly Christian identity, they were camouflaged. They were kind of blending in with the world and the culture around them. So if you, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn now to 1 Corinthians. Whether you have the Bible in your hand or if you have the Bible app on your phone, uh, 1 Corinthians, it's a, a book of the Bible found in the New Testament. So it's towards the back of the Bible. If you're just new to the church, new to the Bible, don't know where it is, 1 Corinthians towards the back in the New Testament. And while it's a book of the Bible, it's actually a letter written by a guy named Paul to uh, the Christian church, the Christians who had gathered in the city of Corinth. It's the first of two letters that the Bible records of Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he wasn't just writing for the sake of writing. You see, Paul had a history with the Corinthians. He, He had a deep and personal connection with the church. He's the one that planted this church in Corinth. He was their founding pastor. He's the one that got them going. He's the one that taught them what they needed to know. He's the one that brought them the gospel message of Jesus Christ and helped equip them to be a a vibrant and healthy church. And he stayed there even for about a year, year and a half before packing up and moving on to his next stop in Ephesus, at which point he left this young and impressionable church to navigate what it means and what it looks like to be in Christian community as gathered people in a very challenging and influential culture around them. All right, so a little bit of context of uh, the city of Corinth. 
Uh, Corinth was a metropolitan city. It was on a peninsula towards the southern part of Greece. And based on its location on a peninsula, uh, there was a port on one side and another port on the other side, making it a commercial hub and an economic powerhouse. Corinth was filled with wealthy, upwardly mobile people. Uh, there, were, there were businessmen, businesswomen, business folks, and social elites that made up all of Corinth. And it was a very vibrant city with lots of cultural and religious diversity. There were Greeks, there, there were Jews, and it was all under the rule of the Roman Empire. So all throughout the city of Corinth, there were people who worshiped different gods, people who held on to different value systems, and they were surrounded by all types of thoughts, actions, and different lifestyles taking place. On the religious side, the Greeks, they were polytheistic, so they worshiped many gods. There were many gods that they worshiped, uh, and there was an emphasis on human wisdom. Uh, obtaining intellectual understanding, information, and being wowed by the Greek philosophers and scholars around them with eloquent speeches and rhetoric. Uh, the Jewish people, even in, the, in the, the Roman Empire, they were free to live out their Jewish faith, but they were doing so with the challenges of extracurricular activities that were common and pretty prevalent throughout the Greek culture that surround them, surrounded them. You, you see, Greek culture, it was wild and free. Uh, the Corinthians were all about partying, going out, living it up, and all sorts of entertainment and satisfying personal pleasures were not only tolerated, but they were also encouraged and also considered to be very acceptable. So basically, if you're trying to picture Corinth, you could basically picture it as a city that had the nightlife of Vegas, New York City, Miami, and Amsterdam all wrapped into one, combined with the intellectual interest of Ivy League students and professors and a theological and moral compass that wasn't really working all that well or flat out broken. Therefore, it's not hard to believe and, and imagine that over time, the church in Corinth it started to look less and less like the church the body, the people that Paul had established and more and more like the wild and free Corinthian culture that they were in. And not long after Paul left Corinth and made his way to Ephesus, he became aware of some issues that were taking place in the church. He was on his phone, he was looking through social media and he started to see some posts that were questionable, catching his attention, some comments on people's posts that were standing out. He, he started receiving letters from people inside the church, people who were asking questions, even looking for loopholes around disputed issues, theological issues, social issues, moral issues. And Paul even had this one group reach out with specific concerns about division that was taking place inside the church among the people of the church. You see, the church was breaking off into these different factions. They were in these different groups, these fan clubs. And they were also intentionally participating in pagan practices and they were giving in to moral laxity disregarding the, the teaching and the identity that Paul established and Paul made sure that they knew and made a priority in the early church. And so while this context, while the, the setup to this is that you should know that Paul's main reason, this primary reason for writing this letter to the Corinthians was to answer some of the questions that they were asking. He, he was writing to address some of the specific issues that he heard about that he knew were taking place among the people inside the church. And his, also his primary reason for writing was to remind the Corinthians of who they are, to remind them of their Christian identity, who they were called to be in Jesus Christ and how they were called to operate and interact and live amongst community with others as Christians. And this reminder is clear towards the beginning of his letter. He actually makes it explicitly clear in chapter one, verse two, where Paul writes this. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. All right, so you might be thinking this is just a, let's skip past this. It's a pretty obvious and basic and straightforward introduction, but he addresses this letter to the church of God that is in Corinth, which actually says a lot about who they are. It's a reminder of who they are, who he sees them to be and who they should see themselves to be in their shared identity as a church. You see, in the Greek culture, the word church, ekklesia, it did not just refer to a religious community, a religious gathering like we might understand it today. Instead, it was a secular word that referred to any public assembly, to any public gathering of people meaning people in Corinth, they would gather for church and socialize about any and all aspects of Greek life and Greek culture. Church was a place for socializing. 
Church was a place to debate and to discuss and to vote on civic issues. It was a place for entertainment. Greek scholars would come and deliver these eloquent speeches and philosophical debates and rhetoric to impress and wow the folks in the church who have gathered just to experience Greek life. Therefore, him addressing them as the church of God that is in Corinth, this is his way of identifying them as a distinctly Christian community and that he's focusing this letter towards the Christians, those who are following Jesus throughout the city of Corinth. All right, and adding to those sanctified in Jesus Christ, in Christ Jesus, it aims to do the same. The word sanctified means holy. It means set apart. So to those sanctified in Jesus is also a way of identifying them as people whose lives, whose identity, and whose purpose has been set apart by God in Jesus for a holy life devoted to God's purposes. You track it with me? So he's reminding them of their identity. He's reminding them of who they are. He's reminding them of what binds them together, what they have in common with one another as the church, as Christian community. And then after reminding them of this shared identity in Jesus, Paul jumps right into the main theme, perhaps, of his entire letter. In verse 10, we read this. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind, in the same judgment. He starts off with this this plea, this appeal, urging them to be united, this appeal for unity in the church, saying, I want all of you to be in agreement. I want there to be no divisions among you for you all to be of the same mind and the same judgment. And so we could read this, we could look at this, and we could start to cringe a little bit and wiggle in our seats, thinking that Paul is, is calling and urging and making this appeal for uniformity in the church meaning that everybody in the church has to come in wearing the same thing, acting the same way, thinking the same way, talking, walking, and just holding the same things, being a cult-like robotic community of exactly the same people with no distinctions and no differences among them. But that's not what Paul is making an appeal for here when he appeals for unity. Uniformity is not what Paul is suggesting. Uh, If we fast forward and condense it just to save some time, to be of the same mind is to be of the same understanding and to be of the same judgment is the same conviction. Therefore, the unity that he's calling them to here, the start of his letter, is to have the same understanding, the same awareness, the same knowledge of Jesus and to hold on to the same convictions about the significance of the gospel of Jesus and the shared identity that they have in common with one another as a Christian community. So he makes this appeal for unity, and then he goes on to explain why he is making this appeal in verse 11. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul, or I follow Apollos, or I follow Cephas, or I follow Christ. So if you read uh, 1 Corinthians, the start of it, it is full of gratitude and thanksgiving and he's praying for them and he loves them, reminding them of their identity, reminding them of what binds them together. Says, I really want you to be unified. I want there to be the same judgment, the same understanding, no division among you. And then he jumps right in and says, I've got some dirt on you. All right, this is where it gets a little bit interesting. He says, he says, I know what's going on there inside your church. Chloe's people have ratted you out. They've passed on all the information all the dirt, and it's not good. So Paul is concerned here. Now, quick aside, we don't know anything about Chloe or who her people might be. Some may think that she is a church member, and this is a small group of folks that like to send the prickly emails to the pastor just to make sure they know what is happening, what they're unhappy with. Not that that ever happens, just hypothetically. She might be the town gossip and she is just stirring the pot, looking for some drama. Hey, you need to know what's going on. Not because she cares, but because she's just trying to get the dirt out there so she can see how everybody will respond. She could be a Yelp reviewer. You know, the ones that think that everybody in the world needs your opinion about what the food was like or what the experience was like. Maybe that's Chloe and her people. We don't know. My guess is that she is a Corinthian mob boss because she has people. If you have people, then that makes you kind of, you're something, right? Commentaries debate that and actually say it's not the case. Friends, regardless of who Chloe and her people might be, we know that Paul considered this to be a trustworthy source. 
right? This was information that he gathered and he didn't dismiss. It wasn't like, all right, well, she's just always talking to those people are always complaining or always saying something. He understood this to be a trustworthy source. He took it to heart and he did something about it. And I do find it kind of humorous that he made sure as he was about to jump in and say, I heard what's going on, that he points the blame. He's like, it was Chloe's fault. It was Chloe's people, right? She's the one. They're the ones that ratted you out. They're the informant in the bunch. Because the report that they had passed on to Paul was that the church was quarreling with one another. They were arguing with one another. There were disputes taking place. They were being divided and fighting with one another. And we're not talking about just the itty bitty differences, quarrels, and debates about which team is best, or even at Point Cafe of like which donut selection, why don't we have this? Why don't we have that? It's too cold in here. It's too hot in here. The words, they don't go up in time. I don't know what I'm singing. These weren't little divisions, debates about what I like, what I don't like, and and just kind of talk in preference here. No, they were quarreling over, they were dividing over pastoral preference. They were dividing over, separating from one another into opposing groups, opposing factions, opposing tribes, and these various fan clubs. Some were saying that, that we're, we're linking up with Paul. We're, we're team Paul. Paul's our guy. Remember, Paul was the founding pastor. He, they, they were like, he is such a good theologian. He cares. He writes these letters to us letters that are full of encouragement, letters that are full of teaching, full of instruction and doctrine. There was this group inside the church that were saying, we're team Paul. Paul is our guy. And then there was this other group that were like, Paul's lame. We're not Paul folks. We're Apollos folks. Apollos is the one that took over that Paul handed the baton to when Paul left Corinth to go to Ephesus. They were like, he's the one who helped us grow. He's the one who helped us reach more people. And he was an eloquent communicator. He was an eloquent and gifted speaker. And so they're like, he, he speaks, he preaches so much better than Paul. He's charismatic, he, he's sincere. It's like he's in it with us. He's not just preaching to us, he's preaching alongside us. We're, we're team Apollos. We got team Paul, we got team Apollos. And then there was this other group that were saying, we're all about Cephas. I'm like, who's Cephas? It's Aramaic for Peter. So there were folks who were like, you can keep Paul, you can keep Apollos, we follow Peter. He's the OD, he, he's an original disciple. He, he's someone who walked with Jesus, learned alongside Jesus, not to mention he was known for his faith. He had serious faith. He got out the boat, he walked on water to demonstrate his faith. He had passion. He, he took his sword out and tried to cut some dude's ear off trying to protect Jesus. He, it, Peter's our guy, Paulo, Paul. We're team Peter. He stands for something. He's bold. He, he doesn't hold back. Those are the three groups. And then there was this one group that was like, well, we belong to Christ. Right? And I always love this because there's always that one person or that one group that's kind of like MBJs, like we, nobody but Jesus. Like Paul, sure. Apollos, sure. Peter, it's all about Jesus. We follow Jesus. You might be thinking, yeah, that's the right answer. That's the one that, that, that we should be like. But, but common to, scholars think that this actually might've been the most divisive one because inside the church, they were the ones that were like, it's just me and Jesus. I don't need anybody else around me. I don't need any leader. I don't need anybody to teach me. I don't need instruction or guidance or to be in it with anyone. Paul, Apollos, Peter, no, it's just me and Jesus. Friends, Chloe's people informed Paul that the Corinthian church was breaking off into these fan clubs and they were placing their loyalty and their allegiance in their version, the early church's version of celebrity pastors. And they were letting their differences and their distinctions and their preferences not only disrupt and cause controversy, debates, and factions within, it was actually dividing them, separating them from one another as a church disrupting the unity that Paul said was essential and continued to be essential for the church. And friends, this isn't shocking for us. Like sometimes we read the Bible and we're like, man, I cannot imagine what that's like to live in biblical times. Like that's a different time, a different context. But this here, what's going on, I'd imagine we are understanding exactly what's going on because this is very common throughout our world and throughout the church today. I mean, there are folks that will be so divided over the pastor, the leader, the influencer, the, whoever it is that they follow. They place them on a pedestal, giving them some sort of elevated status and power, and it actually becomes central to who they are, their identity, their faith. They're bound to a certain name, a certain church name, a certain pastor's name, 
and they're dividing and divided from the people around them. You know, you know the folks, I've had the conversations with people that say so-and-so is the only one that speaks the truth. And I'm not talking about Bridgepoint, I'm talking about the church as a whole. So-and-so, that church, that pastor, this brand, they're the only ones that speak the truth. They're the only ones that are theological, theologically sound. They're the ones that really have a gift and really have a way of making the Bible relevant and relatable. So-and-so is this, so-and-so is that, this brand, this name, this church, so much passion and preference that ends up being the centerpiece of their faith, the centerpiece of their identity, and it becomes divisive with the church, the other believers, and the world around them. And in verse 13, Paul goes on to highlight his concern with the division that has taken place by asking some rhetorical questions for the church to consider. He goes on to ask this, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He confronts the issue that's dividing the Corinthian church by asking, can Christ be divided? Is Christ divided? Can, can the message, the gospel message of Jesus be separated into various parts that some likes, others don't, some agree with, others don't? Can the power of Jesus the fullness of who he is, his presence and power, can it be divided into little factions and fan clubs? Opposing teams saying, well, I prefer this or I prefer that. He asked, was I, it was Paul, was I crucified for you? Did I lay my life down for you on the cross? Did your salvation, did your forgiveness, did your hope, did it come through me? Anything I did, my work. He says, were you baptized in my name? Meaning, did you put your faith and your trust in me? Not was I the vessel in which you came to understand the gospel and Jesus and put your faith in him. He says, did you put your faith and your trust in me? When you entered into the church, that, that symbol of an inward grace externally demonstrated to the church at baptism, he says, did you enter into the church in my name? These are rhetorical questions. So the answer to these he knows is no. And just so we're clear, Paul is not trying to diminish the ministry, the work, or the giftings of, of Peter or Apollos or himself. And he's not trying to diminish the work and the ministry and the gifts of any pastor, leader, or person of influence or, or people around us today. Instead, what he's aiming to do is to remind the Corinthians whose message is at the center of their faith, whose power, whose work, whose giftings they had placed their faith in and whose name they were to be loyal to and to follow instead of being broken apart and divided by personal preference. Let's take a breath for a minute. Let me ask you this. Is there a brand that you all are 100% loyal to? This is like, we're gonna participate. <laughs> is there a brand that you guys are like 100% loyal to? All right, some shouting out, hey dudes. That was the one we got a thumbs up, some people. You don't have to shout it out. But a logo, a name, a brand that gets your business and only gets your business. All right, you're shouting them out. Let me give you my example so we don't become too divided. This is meant to be about unity. I grew up in Atlanta, Atlanta, Georgia, which means I claim and I'm loyal to the Bulldogs, the Braves, the Hawks, and the Falcons, whether you like it or not, whether you think they're good or not. I claim outcast, driving in the fast lane, the varsity, like a chili dog with a frosted orange and pecan pie, right? It's not pecan pie, that's gross, it's pecan pie, sophisticated. That's Atlanta, that's my identity, that's part of the things I claim. But one other thing that I'm 100% loyal to is Coca-Cola. Anybody else? Team Coke in the house. This side, not so much. I'm gonna stay over here. <laughs> Team Coca-Cola, that is what I'm about. And I think that everything else, especially Pepsi, is straight from the devil. <laughs> Haven't found it in the Bible, so don't hold me to that, but that's just my personal opinion. So much so that one time I was eating in a restaurant that I did not know did not serve Coke products. They served Pepsi products, and I unknowingly ordered a Coke Zero. Now you're thinking, why Coke Zero? Because I gotta keep this nice. <laughs> Maybe steer clear of the Coke is what you're thinking. But the waitress, when I ordered this Coke Zero, she said, will Diet Pepsi work? <laughs> you're kind of laughing, you're chuckling, you think I would answer, but my sinuses cleared and I looked up with disgust. <laughs> it was as if she was trying to poison me. 
Like, you know, that feeling of like, I want a Coke. When they say we serve Pepsi products, it's just like, ah. She said, well, Diet Pepsi work. And seeing that, in my opinion, my understanding is that Pepsi is fake. It's a fraud. It's counterfeit. It's not real. My response to her was, as long as Monopoly money will work when it's time to pay the bill. <laughs> You're laughing. We're having fun. I thought it was cute. I was laughing. People at the table rolling their eyes. Kind of thought it was funny, too. The waitress, not so much. <laughs> she looked at me, and she said, honey, it's all a matter of personal preference. She said, it is all just a matter of taste. It's all the same thing. It's the same product, just wrapped in different packaging and sold under a different name. Can I get you a Diet Pepsi or will you just like a glass of water? So I looked at her. I said, I'd love a glass of water, please. (laughs) It did something in me. It still does. I'm loyal to Coke. That's what I prefer. That's what I like. And and it stirred something in me that, that was kind of divisive right? It may be a silly example, but I'm sure you have some of your examples too, whether it's Coke or Pepsi. What about Target or Walmart? Y'all got your preference? Don't shout them out. Let's not get, let's not get all riled up in here. Lowe's or Home Depot, all right? Starbucks, or does it have to be the, the, the local trendy coffee shop? Chick-fil-A versus everybody else? Publix or not much competition with Publix. Maybe some of We get loyal to these brands, to these names, to these places. And I'd imagine we go out of our way to accommodate our preference. And and sometimes it's based on, well, we just prefer their product or we just like their service or we just like this or we just like that. But sometimes it's embedded in something deeper, a belief system or who they support or what this is about. We get so ingrained in making sure that our preference is the priority that we become hostile or divided with the folks who have a different preference than us. Y'all tracking with me? Friends, Paul was concerned that the Corinthians were allowing their, their allegiance to some, someone's name, their preference to a theological brand and their loyalty to a, a packaging and a style in which the gospel was being presented in. It was becoming the most important aspect of their faith. And it was becoming a distinguishing mark of their identity as a church. So much so that they were willing to dismiss, ignore, or set aside the only name, the only work, and the only power that truly brings them together, brought them together, and should hold them together in their common unity in the first place. See, Paul was confronting their divisions by reminding them that their faith, who they are, their their identity, their their common unity, their, their identity as a community was based on and centered around only one man's message. Only one man's performative work, only one man's gifts, and that they were to be loyal to only one man's name. And that's Jesus. And he continues going in on this theme and this reminder throughout the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians, but he continues it at the start of chapter two, which is the last bit we're gonna look at today, where Paul writes this. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. It's like Paul says, let's go back to when I first came to you, where it all began, how it all started with you in the first place, what drew you in, what impressed you, what brought you together and what, what gathered you as a community. He goes back to the message that he shared at the very beginning and the message that they all came to embrace, what entered them into the faith in the first place. It says, I didn't come to you with, with lofty speech or wisdom. I didn't deliver the gospel wrapping it in this fancy packaging that showcased me and highlighted my gifts and made you impressed with myself. It says, I didn't come to you with my signature trademark name stamped on top of the gospel so that you would see me over and before and above you see the gospel. It says, I didn't come to you trying to wow you and impress you with eloquent speech and rhetoric with, with my intellect and my wisdom and my talents being showcased. He says, I didn't come trying to convince you of the gospel message because of me and my power and my work and because of my giftings. No, he says, when I came to you, the message I focused on, the message I put forth, the passion behind the preaching, 
the sincerity behind the illustrations, the significance that he wanted you to grab, that I wanted you to grab. He says, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And why? Why was this the focus? Why was this the priority? Why was this the centerpiece of the message that God preached or Paul preached to them about God? Well, in verse five, he goes on to say this. It's so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I'm gonna read that again. So that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Friends, the reason Paul showcased nothing but Jesus Christ and the message of him crucified was so that the only message that would attract the people in Corinth, the only work, giftings that would impress them, the the only power that would draw them in, keep them in, and the only name that they would place their faith in and be loyal to would be Jesus and not him. Paul focused on nothing but the plain and simple, unpolished and seemingly unimpressive yet compelling message of Jesus Christ, God himself entering into a messy, broken and divided world with a, with a message of mercy, a message of grace and forgiveness and love for all who would receive and delivering a powerful message of hope, reconciliation, and unity that was eloquently communicated on a cross. That's it. That's what Paul wanted them to focus on, what Paul wanted them to hear, and what Paul wanted them to be impressed with, drawn in by, and transformed through. Friends, you don't need me to tell you, but we live in a divided world. We live in a world that is full of differences, full of distinctions, full of preferences outside the church and inside the church and everywhere in between. And sometimes it feels like all we like to focus on, the collective we, making an overgeneralization here, is what it is that divides us, our differences and our distinctions. Political affiliations, sports affiliations, teams, fan clubs, social views, legal views, views around the law, moral views, different preferences and perspectives when it comes to to music or to shopping or to brand loyalty or even to the soft drinks that we choose in a restaurant. And the differences and the distinctions and and the preferences that we see all around us. There's differences and distinctions that take place in the church, the global church, the broader church today. There's different theological differences. There's denominational distinctions, different doctrines, different worship styles, preaching styles, buildings, organizational models and styles. And friends, if the church is known for its distinctions, its loyalty to the things that, that we prefer, and that distinguish us from the people around us, if our identity is based on our distinctions or trying to have no distinctions, or if our unity is dependent upon our differences or trying to remove anything that is different and distinct from the people around us, then we're gonna find ourselves quarreling and arguing and fighting and find ourselves divided into the world, not only the people inside the church, but to the world around us looking at the church, the church will be known for everything that divides us, everything that makes us different, unique, distinctly different from the people around us instead of being known for what it is that unites us. It's almost like the big idea that Paul had for the Corinthians and the big idea that I think the church should be inclined to hear today is this. The church is set apart by its unity in Jesus Christ and him crucified. The church is distinctly different. The people in the church, they're set apart. They look different. There's something different and they're set apart by its unity, what they have in common, what they share together, and that's in Jesus Christ and him 
crucified. You see, what unites us in the church and as the church is not the fancy wrapping, the the name brand, the the people. It's not the packaging and the lights and the way in which we go about it. It's not the people who are on the stage who is leading worship. It's not about whichever bald person happens to be speaking that time. It's not about the incredible gifts, talents, and abilities of anyone on our staff, any pastor or staff member here at Bridgepoint. Even though I think we have an incredible team here, and you should know that we do, that love is the work that they do. That's not why we want you to be here. That's not the only thing that we're saying, come on in. This is what we share in common. This is what we want is your loyalty to us. No, what unites us together in the church and as the church, it is based on and centered around the message of Jesus Christ, the work of Jesus that he has accomplished and the power that Jesus revealed to the world and to each one of us through what was communicated to us through his death on a cross on our behalf. That is the message. That is the power and that is the name that should unite us. So back to that big question that we started with, what makes the church, what sets us apart, what makes us a distinctly different community? It's the same thing that binds us together, the same thing that unites us. It's our faith in Jesus Christ and him crucified. And we are to be loyal to no one else and nothing else other than his work, his power, and his name alone. Amen? which means in your differences, what sets you apart from the people around you, from the world around you, your neighbors, other churches, the people that you see on a regular basis inside your house at Thanksgiving and Christmas with the extended family or in the workplace, all of those things, anything else and everything beyond that beside Jesus and him crucified, anything outside of that is simply a matter of personal preference. Does not mean it's not important or important to you, but it is not what binds you together with other Christians other churches outside of Bridgepoint, or when you gather in this place, one church, multiple campuses, the message, the power, and the work that we want you to be impressed with, attracted by, drawn in, and loyal to is Jesus Christ and him crucified. We you pray? God, as you sent your son Jesus to move and to live and to work in this world. The message that was shared, the message that was communicated was one of mercy, one of grace and forgiveness, one that invited the entire world to recognize the work that was being done, the work that was about to be done on the cross and the power behind it all. My prayer for us at Bridgepoint is that we will continue to be a church that focuses solely on you. That while we pursue excellence and we aim to reach a lost world, we won't be known for being distinctly different because of anything external, any packaging, any name, or any distinct characteristic that tries to set us apart from the people that we share our faith with, but that we would be distinctly different and identified as people who are set apart in and through your son, Jesus, his work, his power, and his name. And that would be the only name that we are loyal to. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. Amen.